What I'm about to describe now is a feature, an extra capability that extends this idea of calibration of um, data. Now, what I've described up to this point is what I would recommend doing always first. What I'm about to demonstrate can work, but does have some pitfalls sometimes. And in a later section, I'm going to describe what to look out for. Here, I'm just going to describe it in a sense that it, this is how it works, and when it works well, it certainly is great. But I don't recommend doing this at all until you are absolutely certain that the matching of darks with data or the use of a bias frame, whatever is appropriate, that works. Then you can play with this idea, which is the optimization of a master dark frame. Optimization means that, in general, what we have for our data, so when we take a light frame, we have, again, our biases here, and then we have some level of dark current. And even if, and this is the thing that might blow your mind, even if these exposure times here for our light frame, our raw light, and our master dark, even if they match, these dark currents may not be the same. It might not be the same amount. And that could be because the temperature of the chip was different, or there was something else electrically that was going on. So it, it's not always the same. Now, the reality is that if you match the times, very likely these are going to be uh, very much uh, similar to one another. Though what you can do is optimize it. You can actually measure, because we can subtract the bias basically from these two level, uh, levels, uh, from these two images, we can measure how much dark current there is and try to scale it. So the way this works is it's, it's all in this black box. Somehow you do some operation here. It requires the master bias to do it. So if you have a master dark and you have a master bias, you can do this trick of optimizing your master dark frame. Uh, and it does something in here and then it comes out with a scaled version of this dark current here that exactly matches so that when you uh, subtract the bias level off and then you subtract the extra little bit of the dark current off, you end up with a perfectly calibrated frame. So now let me reveal what the magic is here. Here's the magic. What you do is what I, I just kind of described it. You take your master dark and you subtract the master bias from it and you're left with just the dark current. Now this has a special name. This is called a thermal frame. As you recall from earlier, I described how uh, electrons are getting, they're elevated, they're getting to the conduction band where they're later going to be captured. Um, and then we'll see that when we download the image. That's that uh, rate of electrical activity that's taking place. But it's because of the chip being at a temperature. So it's often called a thermal frame. Those are the, that's the reason that we have a dark current. Uh, and so what happens inside of WBPP, and it's actually occurring uh, within the, uh, the math here, is to iteratively look at the difference in the noise levels between the master dark and the light frame. And it uh, computes what factor K is necessary to multiply this this amount by, this dark current amount by, or thermal frame, uh, to equal what is being measured in the light frame. So all it's going to do is compute some scaling factor, that's the optimization, but it does so in an iterative way. So it's not uh, simply just find the number in one calculation. It actually does many calculations until it settles on a value, and then that value is used to scale uh, the dark current so that you get a very nice subtraction. That's how it works internally, and there is a little checkbox in WBPP that you can check if you want to take advantage of this. The way it's typically taken advantage of is not you have equal exposures, although that might help, but very likely not at a significant level. It's where if you want to calibrate images that are different times compared to the master dark. So if this is a this raw light frame is a five minute exposure, and this master dark is a 20 minute exposure, 
you can use the 20 minute exposure dark frame to calibrate the five minute exposure by checking this optimized dark frame. And you also have to have a master bias to calibrate the master dark. What is no longer present, for those that still remember the old version of WBPP, it had a checkbox. And that checkbox in the global section said, calibrate master dark frame. And you were supposed to keep it checked. And the reason is because if you're going to be doing optimization, you need to subtract the bias from the master dark. When WBPP makes master darks, as I showed earlier, it's only using image integration. So the bias is always there. So you need to say, yes, I want you to calibrate the master dark. When would you not do that? Uh, it's for people who only bring in thermal frames, which is a very advanced concept. And I'm not going to even go into it here. I might mention it again later under the pitfalls of optimization. But there are people that bring in just the blue part. They bring in frames that start here. And of course, you don't want to calibrate if you've already removed the bias. That's the idea. So once you've optimized this dark current, this thermal frame, and then you subtract it out, everything looks good. And you can calibrate uh, further with the, uh, uh, a master flat, and you end up with your perfectly calibrated light frame. Now, what if your dark frame looks like this? I mean, this doesn't even look like the shutter's closed. It looks like there's a star outside the field. It is closed, though. And what I've described so far, up to this point, have been sensors, CCD and CMOS sensors, that are what I would call well-behaved. They're predictable. This is a kind of variable sensor, and for the reason I'm going to describe, which is that we have, you know, the sensor just like the other sensors. It, it has a bias level. It has a dark current that will uh, build through time. But it also has an additional electronic signature of some kind. This is a very striking example where we have amp glow. So that is an additional signal. And the thing about the amp glow is that if I take a one second exposure and then I take a two second exposure, although the uh, bias level will be the same and maybe there's no dark current, that, that little amp glow, that changes by a degree that is not predictable. It is predictable in the sense that it'll always be the same amount at a given exposure time, but it's not like it is um, linearly uh, changing. So if you double the exposure, the amp glow doesn't get twice as bright. So there is this distinct electronic signature that's on top of the dark current and the bias level. And that requires then, when you're we're using this kind of frame to match dark frames with the data that we want to calibrate because of this variability. So in a graphical sense then, on the left we have our well-behaved sensors and on the right we have the ones, and I'm communicating that with the amp glow here, uh, that are not necessarily going to behave in the same way. The reason why this is so important is that when we try to distinguish, as we could do over here by subtracting a bias and so on, and so on if we wanted to uh, distinguish that dark current, uh, we can't do it. Because if I subtract, say, this zero second exposure here from this frame, you might expect, well, now I'm just left with the dark current, but no, I have dark current plus the amp glow or some other elect electrical uh, electronic signature. And so I can't distinguish. I don't know how much of that is dark current. That's why we need to match these frames. So we then have kind of what I'll call predictable on the left and a more variable on the right, which requires the matching. And that matching means that we end up with a lot more dark frames. Here, we might not have needed as many because in the case of flats in particular, we might just be able to get away with using bias frames. But here we can't do that. If it's a 1.5 second exposure, if it's a 1.7 second exposure, whatever it is, with these kinds of sensors, you need to match it exactly, which means that for every different exposure time, uh, whether it be lights or flats, you're going to have an, a, a dark frame that goes with it. And in the case of them being flats, you call them flat darks. So that's why people sometimes talk about the CMOS uh, sensors and requiring flat darks. That is true, but it's true only for the subset where we have this variable result. There are certainly CMOS 
uh, detectors where that's not a problem. However, as I described earlier, no matter which of these two sensors you have, if you always match the darks uh, to whatever it is you want to calibrate, you'll never have a problem. But for this kind of sensor here, we can't take advantage of this extra coolness of using the bias frame to either calibrate our flats or to optimize our darks. Because again, in order to do dark optimization, you have to know how much dark current there is. So if you have this kind of sensor, this variable uh, with some variable electronic signature, then uh, the dark frame optimization also goes out the window. And that's why, uh, again, for people that are just starting, I recommend, as I mentioned earlier, don't do any of that dark frame optimization. Just make sure matching works. And then you can play with uh, some of these other features and determine what kind of sensor you have or whether it behaves well when you do these other things. So the calibration process, when you have one of these sensors uh, that we can't distinguish the quantities, we just have to match exactly, uh, the process is the same, certainly in terms of matching the dark here. We're going to subtract our, our matching dark, and we, then we get our signal, and then of course we apply our flat. And our master flat is again created by a set of raw flats, which are calibrated by this master flat dark, and then ultimately integrated together to create the master flat. Uh, but it is using these individual master flat darks, the darks that are meant for these flats, uh, they need to match exactly for each one of these master flats that we're generating. Everything that I've done so far, with the slides being constructed the way that they were, echoes what is in WBPP. So I want to wrap this up by showing you now how all of that uh, instruction was really leading to this. Uh, we have what is communicated here by the grouping, but also there is, and you saw this earlier in the tour, a button for show calibration diagram. Click on that, and for any particular image that uh, you're calibrating, you will get a little diagram which shows you exactly what is going on. So for example, here, uh, the flat is being calibrated by a master dark of the same exposure time. They match, perfect. That means that my calibrated flat, it's going to be good, it's gonna work out. Likewise, for the light frame, we have a 300 second exposure. It's gonna first be calibrated, that is uh, the master dark will be subtracted from the light frame that removes both the dark current and the bias. Um, and then it'll be flat fielded by a master flat uh, ultimately resulting in a calibrated light frame. The point here is that WBPP is now so evolved that not only is it a tool which will expedite you know, the tedium of uh, calibration of data, but it also communicates to you to really minimize any mismatch or anything that might cause a problem so that your data wouldn't end up being calibrated properly because you can just plainly see what is going to be uh, used to calibrate a particular file. And then you can be confident, you can be sure that the problem is not with WBPP. Um, it is instead with maybe something with the data or some other element of the process. Here is perhaps uh, the more complicated example. It's not really complicated, but this is what the diagram looks like. It should look familiar for dark optimization, where we have a light frame and a dark frame of two different times. So the uh, master dark, uh, the master bias is subtracted from the master dark. And then on this corner, what I showed you is the inside story of what is called a thermal frame, which is optimized uh, iteratively. Uh, PixInsight tries to determine how to make the dark current um, that's left over in this thermal frame equal to what is in the light frame, and uh, that is done by this ultimate scaling factor. Then you subtract that from the light frame, giving you an electronically calibrated light frame, which then needs to be further flat fielded by the master flat, and you can see it's using a 2.5 second clear flat. This is a clear exposure ultimately giving us the calibrated light. Everything makes sense here. WBPP now fully exposes what is going on, and I hope finally dispels this idea that this tool, this script, is somehow doing something different than if you were to do it manually. It's not. 
you get the same result. The math is the same as long as it is configured in the same way that you would do through a manual calibration. The results will be identical. So I really hope you take advantage of this new capability of WBPP, and I hope that it you know, helps in the processing of your data so that things go more smoothly, easily, understandably, and uh, ultimately results in optimal pictures that uh, you can create uh, beautiful images of the universe.